This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. The brain is a massively complex organ that drives all behavior. Despite over 50 years of mapping research and more than a millennia of anatomical study, we know surprisingly little about how different neurons are wired for learning and thinking inside the brain. A landmark achievement in neuroscience has occurred with the first complete map of a brain, in this case, that of a larval fruit fly. To learn more about this work, we welcome Joshua Vogelstein, Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. How did you first become interested in neuroscience? I had this awareness in high school when I was thinking about what to write my high school senior thesis about, that all animals have a brain. And it's a unique thing because not all animals have arms or legs or even skin, but every single animal has a brain. And so I thought if I was going to do something that would be really impactful for all of life, I would understand how brains work. Can you tell me how the NSF support with your career award has impacted your research? One of my favorite things about the NSF Career Award is that it's the only grant I have where I was really invited to write about exactly what I thought I wanted to do. Typically, for a solicitation, I try to write what I think they want me to do. But because it's so open-ended with the Career Award, I really got to write what I thought I should do for the next five years. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to follow that and do that work. What sort of uh, projects have you been working on under that grant? Well, there's been a lot of work on connectomics, on us trying to understand brain networks and how they work. Um, but there's also other stuff. There's a lot of high dimensional statistics to understand what's going on with behavior, with physiology, with lots of other applications. So what is Neuronex and how are you involved? So Neuronex is a NSF program that started several years ago. I applied for and won one of the original Neuronex applications, and that was for work um, related to building large-scale computational infrastructure for big data. This was right around the time that neuroscientists started getting terabytes and terabytes of imaging data for electron microscopy and whole brain fluorescence microscopy data sets. And there was really no infrastructure in place to store it in such a way that it would all be open access. So we applied and we built a lot of that infrastructure. And then there was another solicitation a few years later. And that time, Kristen Harris invited me to join in her proposal, which was quite visionary, all about how synaptic weights uh, impact behavior and how to estimate them and how to do analysis with them. And so we've been fortunate enough to work with an amazing team led by Kristen to study lots of aspects of synaptic weights. So you mentioned synaptic weights. For people that don't know what that is, could you explain a little bit? Sure. The way brains work is that there's lots of neurons. In a human brain, it's about 100 billion neurons, and they all connect to one another through something called synapses. Each synapse has a particular size and shape and connection strength. And so if one neuron is active, it has an effect on the neurons in which it has synapses. And the bigger the effect is related to the size and the weight and the overall strength of the synapse. Can you explain what a connectome is and why is it difficult to map? So the origin of the word connectome comes from about 10 years ago and is based off the word genome. So a genome is the set of your entire genes. A connectome is a set of your entire connections in the brain. So every single neuron and every single synapse between every pair of neurons is the connectome. And why is it so hard to map out? For a number of reasons. One is there's really a lot of synapses. So in the human brain, there's about 100 billion neurons and 1,000 trillion synapses. So finding all of them, even if they were really big, would take a really long time. But it turns out they're not very big. They're very small. And not only are they small, but the connections that go from one neuron to a synapse to the next neuron, those connections or branches are incredibly thin on the order of nanometers, like a thousand times thinner than the smallest thing you can see with your naked eye. And so we require exquisite microscopes and all sorts of other technology that can image an incredibly high resolution, and then technology that enables us to manually trace or use computer vision to automatically find every single branch that connects every single neuron to every single other neuron. And I think for me, that was one of the really exciting things reading through your paper is you have some great visualizations of this. How did you go about getting into mapping out this larval fly brain? Actually, my interest in it started about 
10 years ago when I was working on uh, statistics in high dimensions, and I realized that we didn't really have any tools to do statistics of high dimensional networks. There was lots of tools to analyze networks that people use to analyze, say, energy networks, traffic networks, um, food networks. But brains are a little bit different because we have lots of them. There's lots of similar copies. And so I wanted to understand how we could understand patterns that are across different networks. And the statistics and the AI didn't exist to be able to do that analysis. So I started working on that. And the idea we had, this is 10 years ago, is I thought, well, what if we trained a fly to know calculus and then compared its brain to one that didn't know calculus and we could see how those brains are different? Is that possible? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, flies cannot learn very much, um, but they can learn some things. And so while they can't learn calculus, they can learn things like this smell is associated with getting eaten. So turn away when you see that smell or when you smell that smell. At that stage, did you do experiments with that, trying to train different reactions? I actually just spent the last 10 years studying data science and making up new math so that we could figure out if anyone ever did that experiment, we'd have the tools to be able to do the analysis properly. Right. And and part of building that new skill set has led to this first ever, right, of any brain, the complete map? That's right. So there's been three nervous systems that were mapped before this one. And there's a debate whether those ones count as brains or not. This one is clearly a brain. There's 3,000 neurons and 500,000 connections, and they have regions of brain just like all the other brains in the animal kingdom. How can mapping a connectome of a brain, in this case the fly brain, help us understand how the brain functions and other aspects of neuroscience? Well, to enter that, I would say think about something like a radio. If you wanted to understand how a radio functions, one thing you could do is look at the wiring diagram. And that would really help, particularly if you wanted to fix it, if it was broken. So if you don't care about fixing a radio, you turn the knobs and you change the channel and the volume and it's all good. And you know how it functions. And that takes you very far for listening. And then when it breaks, what are you going to do? You have to understand what the wiring diagram is in order to fix it. And so the main motivation, one of the main motivations for the whole field, including mine, is when brain function goes awry in humans or non-human animals, we want to help. We want to be able to support people and other beings to be able to deal with whatever their struggles are. And at its root, that comes down to issues with how the brain may be wired. And there's going to be a lot of takeaways from this that are usable in other kinds of brains, correct? Sure. The Drosophila brain, although it's small, Drosophila have many similarities to humans. So, for example, they have to make decisions. They have to navigate. They learn things. We do all those things, too. So our ability to understand how they do those things informs us on how we do things. When you were building the map, what was your biggest surprise? You know, in a way, the biggest surprise was some of the resistance from many of my colleagues in neuroscience. Lots of people have been under the belief that to understand the brain, we really need to understand physiology, just the activity of neurons, and we don't really need to understand the connectivity. So although we started and we thought everyone would be like, yeah, of course we need that, lots of people were like, nah, we don't need that, hmm. and weren't interested in it and didn't want to read our papers or anything like that. Wow, that's really a surprise to me. I would think that that's really core to how, like just understanding how the different parts work alone doesn't work without the whole story. Partially perhaps it's surprising to you because I'm highly biased and I've, <laughs> I've made all the arguments in favor of why it's a good idea. I think there's lots of arguments that suggest that it wouldn't be that worth it. I mean, it was very expensive, very time consuming. It took 12 years to do a baby fly we have it already for a, a C. elegans, a very small worm, since the 70s. And the main argument against it is we don't know how a C. elegans behaves yet from its connectome. So why do we mm -hmm. think we'll be able to figure that out more in a fly than we did with a C. elegans? Well, it just seems like it really connects the dots with what's doing what. Like, even if you know where a thought happens in the brain or something, how it turns into muscle movement or something, it seems like that would be vitally important to me. 
That's kind of my take. You know, if you do <laughs> medical school, the first year you spend half on anatomy and half in physiology often. And this is the anatomy part of the brain. It's just it's not just what's where, but also what's connected to where. Can we talk about how how did it take that long? Like what what was the biggest challenges in getting the pieces and putting it all together? So the first step is taking a brain, which is already the size of a grain of salt, and slicing it into about 10,000 slices. If you screw that up at all, then you have to throw out the whole thing and start over because missing any slice makes it hard to trace what's happening across slices. So that took a long time and was very tedious. Now you have all these images. It's terabytes of images. And somebody has to figure out where all the processes go, which neurons are connected to neurons. That took another several years. Now we have an estimate of what's connected to what. And so I wasn't involved in those first stages at all. And they handed me this thing. And when we first got it, because we have tools to do the analysis, we did a bunch of analysis and we said, hey, some of this stuff doesn't make any sense. It's not biologically feasible or um, it's just very unlikely. And so we handed it back to them and we found all sorts of issues because we could do the analysis. And we iterated that process for maybe a year or two to really clean the data up. Once we had that, then there was the actual doing the analysis of the connectome that we decided is worth studying. And that was also difficult because no one knew what to do or how to do it. We had to come up with all that stuff. We specifically didn't really know which questions we thought we could get answers to that we would believe. It's pretty easy to just say, oh, there's this many neurons in this brain. But we wanted to derive some more general principles, things like the left and the right brain are similar or not in, in these kinds of flies. And so we needed to come up with statistical tools that would enable us to answer those questions and have degrees of uncertainty that are quantified and all of that good stuff. What was the role of social engineering in this project? There's people from neuroscience, computer science, statistics, and we all had to work together in order to achieve a big goal. And we all had slightly different language, slightly different goals, slightly different interests. And to do it effectively required a degree of humility for each of us to understand where our role is, what we have specific value, and then trust the others to do where their expertise is. And so that kind of collaborative effort where we really trust each other and work together across disciplines I think really stood out for me in this project. As you were building these tools, and I, I know you've talked about this a lot in other pieces of work you've done, what are the biggest challenges in dealing with big data? There's so many. The original <laughs> challenges were literally just storing the data. So when I started dealing with this maybe 12 years ago, I literally bought a bunch of hard drives from Amazon and built clusters myself because all the data wouldn't sit on a hard drive or even a computer. That problem was more or less solved by the cloud. Um, but then there was all the software that would be need to store, manage, access, visualize, analyze. That was another big just computational challenge. And then there's a statistics challenge is how do you do the analysis itself? Because like I said before, it's a different kind of data and the tools didn't exist. And then there's a neurobiology challenge, which is what can we actually answer about brains with just one connectome? Usually when you do biomedical studies, you get lots of data, tens or hundreds of subjects that you can compare across. But here we just had a sample size of one. So it's not the normal study and it demands not the normal kind of analysis. You're working a lot to make your data available on an open basis. Why is the open availability of data and processes to use data important? It's important to me kind of relating back to the first thing we talked about, which is everyone has brains. So I think everyone might be interested in what they look like and arguably inspired by what they like look like to study them more. So we built something called the Open Connectome Project like 10 years ago. And since there's been at least 100,000 people that have just looked at brains from 100 different countries all around the world. To me, that's just inherently valuable because it's educating the public about what brains look like. And um, it's amazing when you actually look at them. It. It's mind blowing. Who knew that it looked like that? I certainly didn't. And then every time there's a new species, I look at a new one. It's like, whoa, that looks different again in surprising ways that it, no one expected as far as I know. How can we connect 
animal intelligence to machine learning and AI? It's such a great question. And it's really, I'd say one of the prevailing interests in my group is to understand the relationship between natural intelligence in animals with brains and artificial intelligence. And the mainstream view right now is that AI is maybe achieving human level performance in certain tasks, but um, not as good as at least humans on lots of things. And our view is different. Our view is AI is doing terrible on fundamental issues that even larval Drosophila can do or honeybees. The, the thing that AI does is just, it's a completely different kind of learning. And um, it's not really capturing what's happening in artificial and in natural intelligence. And perhaps that's why it goes so awry. It learns all sorts of things that perpetuates harm and reinforces systemic biases rather than correcting them, which is what I think those of us who are developing AI would really want. We're trying to make the world a better place. It just turns out often that's not what's happening. What are you looking forward to happening in the next 10 years? What are you working towards? Well, the next 10 years, I don't know. Lots of people are trying to do the mouse connect home next. I'm fundamentally interested in understanding the mechanism of learning and eventually mechanisms of enlightenment. I like um, bridging the gap between spirituality and science. And I think there's lots of people having lots of ideas about how to make the world a better place in terms of different spiritual practices. And um, there's lots of ambiguity on how that's affecting the brain or how we might design more effective techniques that support people to just feel better about life all the time. So that's what I want to work on. And it seems unlikely to happen in the next 10 years, but maybe in our lifetime. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Special thanks to Joshua Vogelstein. You can watch an expanded version of our conversation on our YouTube channel by searching at NSF Science. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts, and if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.